We're going to jump into God's Word this morning. We have been in a journey in the Gospel of Mark, but um, I hope I heard God correctly this week because uh, I feel like He has a different message for us this morning. And so if you'll bear with me, we're going to take some time this morning to talk about a very serious matter that affects all of us. And I want to talk about the issue of identity theft this morning. Um, (laughs) <laughs> you're laughing. You're like, what are, what are we talking about here? <laughs> Many of you may know from firsthand experience what it's like to have someone online or otherwise, maybe with a loved one, an elderly loved one, uh, steal information from them and rob them. The, the, the statistics are that every 22 seconds, someone experiences and becomes a victim to identity theft. So it happens all the time in our culture and to people that we know and we love. I heard a story about this guy. His name is Todd Davis. And some of you may know this company, but a few years ago, he had this really great idea. He thought, I'm gonna demonstrate to everyone how confident that I am in our ability as a company to keep their identity secure. So Todd Davis went online in in their national ad campaign and he put his name and his real social security online. He thought, this will show everybody that they can trust our company. They will not experience identity theft. (laughs) Fast forward just a few minutes later, and Mr. Davis was awakened very quickly with the reality that over 13 different attempts had been made to take out loans on his identity and using his social security number. He was followed by creditors and credit agencies because there were thousands of dollars of unpaid bills and purchases that had been made in his name because he put his social security number online. Don't put your social security number online. I share that as an example this morning because all of us know better than to put those kinds of details online and to safeguard our identity. But this week I was just struck in my own life by the way things played out in my life of how important it is to protect our identity, our spiritual identity of who God says that we are. The reason I'm preaching this message is because I started out really well this week. I was in my office. I was preparing for the Gospel of Mark. And just one after another, I experienced places of failure in my life, just seeing myself not handle situations as a parent the way that I should have, seeing myself um, falling back into old habits of overeating and other things in my life and realizing like, what a messed up, broken person I am. And my thoughts by the time I got to Tuesday and then Wednesday began to overwhelm me. I felt, I've actually felt very depressed this week, to be honest with you. And I was struggling to come up out of the mud I was struggling to believe that I could even stand here to preach because I felt that I was a failure. I felt that I didn't deserve to be here in this position that God had called me to or any other position as father or as husband or as a friend. Maybe you've been there before. You've had a week like that. You've had a day like that. And you've begun to wrestle with these kinds of questions and of who am I? What is wrong with me? What is my identity? And we begin to base our identity on how we perform, on what other people think of us, on how we did in our past or we didn't do. And before long, we find ourselves in a spiral of discouragement. We are living in defeat. And we know that the Bible tells us that we're to live in freedom, that Jesus has brought us the truth to set us free, but our experience is anything but freedom. Our experience is anything but living and flying above our circumstances. And I believe that God brings us back in those moments if we're listening to his spirit, if we're in his word, to the reality of who we are, what our true identity is that is daily being stolen, attempted to be stolen by an assault from the world and the devil. And so what we're going to talk about this morning is the very real issue of identity theft. Maybe you're here and you're thinking this message isn't for me, and you don't have to listen if that's you. But I would venture to say that most of us this week did something that we regretted. 
Most of us this week remembered something about our past or a failure. Most of us sinned this week and fell short of what we knew God had called us to in our lives. Most of us were bombarded with some kind of thought or lie like, you'll never get it together. You'll never get victory in that area. You'll be just like your parents. Or maybe you just were overcome with the idea that God doesn't really love you because of all your shortcomings and your failures. And until you get it together, you're on the JV team in God's kingdom. So if that's any of you this week, then this message this morning is for you because I believe that God wants us to not have our identities stolen day after day, week and month and year and decades and wake up one day and realize that we lived far below what God says about us and what he has given us in the riches of Christ that are ours. Amen? And so this is a message, I believe, for all of those of us who are on this journey because all of us experience attack on our identity. See, this, this goes back to the very beginning, this issue of identity theft. It's something that's always been under assault since the beginning of time. See, God understands how important your identity is and my identity is. The very first words God spoke to his son after he came to this earth, we find in Matthew 3, verse 16, it says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Think about this. Jesus hadn't yet even done a single thing in ministry. He hadn't done a miracle. He hadn't preached a message. He was just starting out. And from the very beginning, God goes out of his way to say, this is my son. I love him. This is his identity. You don't have to do anything to perform for me to love you and support you. Can you imagine the difference that must have made in Jesus' life and his ministry as he started out, knowing what was about to come? What was awaiting him? How many of you know that the message of the gospel that many of us have responded to in our life is a message that we've been saved, that God has rescued our lives by grace. We didn't do anything to earn it. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. But you see, God's not the only one who understands the significance and the power of our identity. Satan knows the power of the identity that God has given to us. You remember Satan's very first words to Jesus. They happened just a few seconds later after his father spoke to him at his baptism. Mark tells us he was thrown out into the desert <laughs> to be tempted. And while he was there, it says in chapter 4, the devil came and said to Jesus, if you are the Son of God. What did God just say a few minutes earlier? This is my Son. If you are the Son of God, then tell these stones to become loaves of bread. He was trying to plant seeds of doubt and confusion in Jesus' mind about what his identity is. He wanted Jesus to forfeit his identity by relying on himself rather than relying on his Father. Does that sound familiar to anybody else here today? That line of attack in your life, those kinds of words, and you call yourself a Christian? After you just said that? After you did that to the person at that intersection? You think anyone's going to want to hear what you have to say? That you're worth their time as a Christian based on what you just did last week? You think there's any way God's going to change you? It's hopeless for you. And it doesn't stop, does it? It just never stops. The assaults just keep on coming. Satan didn't stop. That was his first attack. Just a few moments later, we see in the next few verses, the devil then took Jesus to the city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple and said, if you're the son of God, 
Jump off, Jesus. Go for it. Why did Satan continue to assault and undermine and question Jesus' identity? Here's the issue that you and I have to understand this morning is that Satan has no other chance. He has no other chance of ruining our lives, destroying God's call on our lives, other than to use lies and deceit and to question our identity. If he can tell you and convince you that you are something and someone that you're not, game over. Game over. How many of your parents lived in a cycle of addictions in their lives? They messed up your family, broke up your trust because they couldn't get past this idea that God said one thing about them, but their experience and their past and, this, and the devil in the world reminded them that they were actually this. And so to medicate their pain, they found their way into these cycles of destruction and addiction in their lives. And you do it too, and I do it too, don't we? When we have those moments where we live far below who we know that we are, we reach for things outside of ourselves, don't we? We reach for other identities outside of ourselves that are less than the identity that God has given to us. Praise God that Jesus in these moments of assault on his identity stood the test. He stood up to the challenge unlike those who came before him. See, where Jesus found victory is where our ancestors stumbled in defeat. Genesis chapter 1, we read these words, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. What didn't Adam and Eve have? They had everything. They were made in the image of God. If you go to Washington, D.C. and you look at the Lincoln Memorial, what do you see? You see a giant piece of stone, right? No, you don't see a piece of stone. You see a stone that has been hewn in the image of a man. And when you see the stone, you don't see it. You see the image of a man who lived hundreds of years before. See, we have been made in the image of God. We are of dirt. We're from the dust. But God's intent was that we would be different than the creation. When people would see us, they would say, oh my goodness, they're in the image of that being, that perfect and divine being. There's something unique and special about them. And God said, it's very good. These are very good. And not only are they good, but I'm going to give them a job that's special, a dominion to rule over the earth. And so Adam and Eve, with the image of God and with this call to rule, began to live in this perfect world. But we all know that they ended up complicating things quite a bit for all of us. And they didn't fulfill their destiny of intimacy with God and fellowship with him because Satan entered the story. And because he couldn't kill them, because he was not allowed to kill them, he did what he always does. He lied about their identity, didn't he? He, he went to the very root of the most important thing about who they were, their identity. And we read in chapter 3, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we can eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Enter Satan in perfection. And he brings up the tree. And Eve even acknowledges that she's not supposed to eat from it. But look at Satan's reply. He said, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, 
your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And this is the root of the enemy's lie in our life. This is the root of the enemy's lie in Adam and Eve's life, that God is holding out on us, that God is not really good. That's the first lie. But the second lie, he said, you're really not like God all that much. You're not like God. And Eve bought the lie, hook, line, and sinker. I'm not like God. Though God had just made her in his very image, she forgot in moments when she was questioned about her identity. And so the original deception of the enemy begins with our identity. And that's been Satan's premier strategy ever since the beginning, to get us to believe that we are less than, that we have less than what God says we have in who we are. And it didn't matter that it was a lie because a lie believed to be the truth has the exact same power in our lives. It brings the same devastation into our existence. Have you noticed that identity is a pretty big topic these days in our culture? I think I say that word all the time, identity, right? We talk about people's identities in our culture because people are trying to define themselves in the world in ways that are apart from how God has defined their identity. And so we find people identifying themselves by their race, right? By their ethnicity, by their jobs, by their degrees, by their relationships with people in certain groups, preferred groups. We identify ourselves by our genders and pronouns and relationships at us. I'm single, I'm married, I'm dating. It's complex, <laughs> right? By our religion, our nationality, our politics. You go on and on. All of us have something that comes to mind when someone asks us, who are you? And we reach for these identities outside of ourselves. I'm a this political party. This is my gender. This is my marital status. And we go on and on and on. And as time goes on, the issue of our identity gets more and more complicated and confusing because we move it further and further away from the center of who God says that we are. Rewind the tape. Rewind the tape to Tuesday, Wednesday. What happened to me? Ah, I failed in an area of my parenting. I told you I overate to medicate my pain. And I realized the lies started to come. Who in the world do you think you are, Seth Hankey? You stand up there on Sunday mornings. You, people think you're a good husband, a godly father. And down I go, and down I go, and I can't get back up. Because my identity is fixed out here somewhere in what you think or how well I perform, rather than and who I am, and what God says about me. See, if our identity is based on anything other than what God says, we'll always be unhappy, we'll always be unsatisfied, we'll always need the next relationship, the next person, the next fling, the next show, the next Amazon product, the next job. Nothing will be enough. It will never satisfy us. if our identity is not found in our birth rather than our performance. See, that's the key for us, is to find our identity in our birth. What does the Bible tell us about our birth? It says in 1 Peter 1, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born, what church? Again, that's the key to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
The key is our birth, not our performance, not what we did last week. He goes on and he says in verse 23, you have been born again. Read this with me. Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding work of Our identity is rooted, the Bible tells us, in our birth. But the problem is that all of us were born with a birth defect, weren't we? We're born into this world in sin because of our parents. The Bible says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Romans says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all have sinned. And so the default for every human being when they are born is that they are born with the inherited sin of Adam. Doesn't matter how nice a person is, how much they give to charity or do for the poor or obey the law, if they have not been born again, church, then they have an identity issue in their lives. And our identity in relating to God is dependent upon our birth, not our performance. But see, that means that you can have people who are born again, believers who sin and live in ways that sometimes would make you cringe, like your children do sometimes with the actions that they make in their lives. But they are still acceptable to God and loved by their father. They are still acceptable to God because it is an issue of their birth, not of their performance. See, once Satan can get us to think that what we do is who we are, then he's got us. He's got our foot in the trap. And the reason he's got us is because we can never function outside of our perception of ourselves. You will always function within the perception of who you think you are. And once he has got us thinking that we are something or we're not something, then he's got us. Because now we're defining ourselves by a different set of terms in our lives. Our identity can only come from our birth. So therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the Bible tells us, he or she is a brand new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. That means who you were before your new birth, it's it's buried. That person, that history, it's not coming back. And sometimes you got to take your foot and you got to stomp the old man back into the ground, right? Sometimes you need to remind yourself that that's not you, even on your worst days. The old, the Bible says, has passed away. If you haven't put that old away, you need to have a funeral service sometime. You need to have a funeral service for that old you that keeps popping up out of the grave, the arm reaching through the dirt to grab you by the heel and pull you back. God says, put it to death. Put that old person, that old life to death. You're a brand new being on the face of the earth. You're a brand new creation. See, that's why baptism is so powerful. Because in baptism, we take the person, we shove them down under the water. I've seen some funny baptisms on YouTube before. And we put them under the water and we hold them there until they die, right? The Bible tells us that we've died with Christ and when we pull them back up, we are raised to life with him anew. And that's who we are. And that's who I am today. I'm not my failures from earlier this week. You're not the sum total of your failures or your past. You are who God says you are. You are a new creation. You have been born again to a living hope in him. And that is the truth that you have to take hold of because the devil is working overtime to grab you by the heel, to grab you by the foot and pull you back and remind you, tell you that you aren't who God says that you were. One of the most beautiful things in all of scripture is the way that God speaks about us. 
the Apostle Paul left us so many wonderful signs and reminders of our identity. He encouraged his readers over and over, if you read through his epistles, to live new lives. And he used this phrase, in Christ. He would say, in Christ. And we see this phrase, in Christ, in him, in the Lord, 164 times in the Bible, in the New Testament. Paul even said, I glory in Christ. It was his mantra. It was his mindset. It was how he thought of his identity. See, being in Christ is a life-changing experience for us as believers. Something that goes beyond our feelings, something that goes beyond our actions. And we read this in Colossians. For in him, in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And check this out. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Would you read this with me? In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. We keep going on here. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Amen. The fullness of God dwells in Christ and the word of God tells us that Christ dwells in you so the fullness of God dwells in you, Christian. How's that for something pretty special? You can lose everything you own. They can steal your identity online. Drain your bank account. That would be really bad. But you would have the fullness of God dwelling in you in Christ Jesus. How's that? See, the the good news of the Christian life is that God isn't about making bad people good. He's not trying to get Christians to be better people. But God is making dead people alive in their brand new identity in him. He doesn't just want to clean up your life so you're nicer because you're not going to get nicer. He wants you to die. He wants me to die. So what happened to me this week is that I was so focused and preoccupied with self, self, and Jesus is just like, go ahead and die. Go ahead and hold the old man under the water again. Remember who you are. Let me live my life through you. Let me remind you of who you are. Sadly, so many of us struggle day after day to live in this new way that God has birthed us and called us to live as his children. It's a life that has to be lived by faith. It is a life that has to be taken hold of by faith. Romans 6 says, so you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. How do we do this? You're like, Seth, this is great. I've been living this way. I want to live this way. How do I do it? Romans tells us you have to consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Something very special about this word consider. Everyone say consider. Consider is this accounting term. I don't like accounting. I don't like numbers and But this word consider is this accounting term that's used to compute and calculate and take inventory of things. It has to do with how things really are. What we actually have in our bank accounts versus what we hope will be in our bank accounts. Anybody been there before? See, if I had a call this week from my wife and she said to me, Seth, she said, I need need to pay $100 today for the dentist. It's got to be out of It's got to be out of pocket. Um, Can I get $100? And I would say to her, well, why don't you just go by and see what happens when you put your card in? Hopefully there'll be $100 in there. 
Paul is saying that is not considering or reckoning as if though it were. So I would tell my wife, absolutely go by the bank, put your card in the machine. There is $100 in that machine. You're going to be good to go. Paul is saying you should consider as a fact that you are dead to sin and alive to Christ. Game over. You're not mostly dead. This isn't money python. You're not going to struggle for the rest of your life. You don't have to keep going back and forth thinking I'm a sinner one moment and a saint the next. You are a saint. You are a saint, a holy one. But it comes down to us reckoning, considering as if though the money is in our account, we can cash it right now that we are dead to sin and alive to Jesus Christ. Amen? And this is the way that God is calling us to live in our new reality as his new creation. He says, go ahead and start getting your minds renewed. The world will speak to you and inform you about who you are. It'll tell you a different story. I want to tell you my story about who you are, how I've created you in my image, my good love and plans for your life, no matter what you do. I, you're not going to get separated from me. Come hell or high water, come pandemic, come tragedy, come wars, come everyone else leaving you in your life and everything falling apart. I will always love you. Listen to my story. Rest in my love for you and in the identity that you have in my son, Jesus Christ. We have to land the plane. We're going to take communion together which I'm so excited for. But I believe this morning, maybe God is wanting to speak to your heart. Maybe this has been you this week, month, year, decade. And God's saying, child, I never made you, designed you to live down here. I've called you to rise above, to know that you are in Christ, a new creation. You've had a new birth. You need to reckon all of this by faith. There's one thing that God loves. He loves faith. He loves when we put our boots on the ground. You put your bottoms in a seat today and you had faith. And I believe God would want us to say to us this morning, put your feet on the ground, the firm reality. Take it to the bank of what I've said about you. You will continue to get hammered and undermined you will be assaulted. But if you know who you are, as Jesus understood who he was, you can stand and you can live a life of triumph and victory. You can experience the bliss and the joys of all that God has for you as his child. Not one day to come in the pearly white gates of heaven, but right now on this earth. How many of you want to live far above where you live right now? I want to live far above where I live in my experience. I want to experience more of the joys and the sweetness of my relationship with Jesus and of the inheritance that is yours and that is mine in Christ Jesus. Maybe this morning, Jesus is asking you and inviting you to surrender all other identities that you have been reaching for in your life and to take hold of the one identity that is most important, the one identity that will see you through everything in this life because none of the others will. Only being in Christ Jesus. I want to invite the worship team to come up at this time and invite our communion team to come as well as we prepare to take communion together. We invite anyone here today who is a follower of Jesus, regardless of your age, to join us in this celebration, in this feast, in this meal, remembering what Jesus did for us. And I want to remind you of the words of the gospel. 
These are beautiful words written by Eric Ludi that remind us of all that is ours and all that Jesus has done for us in the gospel. Nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, conceived of the Holy Spirit. He lived a sinless life, and in his mouth was no guile. He was the scent of the Father. He was God himself, a heavenly emissary of divine love and mercy. At the age of 33, Jesus Christ gave himself into the hands of sinners in order to fulfill all righteousness and redeem those in bondage to sin and captive to the eternal consequences of sin. Jesus suffered in Gethsemane. Under the cruel tortures of evil men, he was scourged and bore the infamy of a criminal, though he was innocent, pure, and spotless. And as a Passover lamb, he died instead of sinful humanity, a propitiation and an atonement for our sins. He redeemed a fallen humanity by the shedding of his precious blood, reconciling us to God. He justified those who would believe in faith, and he clothes them in his righteousness. He bore the full consequence of our sin and saved us from the wrath of God abiding upon us and from the wrath of God to come. In dying and being resurrected, Jesus both proved himself the Messiah and also created a new and living way for sinful humanity to be restored to a right relationship with the Father. This same Jesus that died, church, was buried, and on the third day, in the early morning hours of the first day of the week, he was raised again to life by the Holy Spirit. He was witnessed among men, and on the 40th day after his resurrection, he ascended before the witness of his disciples to go and be with the Father to take his seat at the right hand of authority, where all things were placed under his feet. Ten days later, the full fruition of his great work on the cross was realized on this earth when the Holy Spirit was sent forth to dwell in those who believe, empowering them to live the pure and righteous life of Jesus, enabling them to overcome sin and the devil, and exerting the very authority of Jesus Christ in their actions and words and lives. This is the truth of the gospel. This is what Jesus has done on your behalf, on my behalf. 